Probiotics. 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 There's 40 trillion bacterial cells that live in your gut. More and more studies showing the balance of bacteria in your digestive system is linked to your overall health. Probiotics have been claimed to do everything from improving your immune system to reducing symptoms of depression and even fighting cancer. As a result, the global market for these miraculous bacteria is worth more than $70 billion. But are probiotics the silver bullet you've been led to believe? At the same time that consumption of these supplements has increased, we've also seen a rise in cases of IBS and other chronic digestive illnesses, so our collective gut health is worse than ever. So do these microbial miniatures really improve our health, or are they just a burden on your bank balance? Or could they actually cause us more harm than good? Well, to answer that question, let's go on a journey deep into the bowels of, well, your bowels, and reveal the surprising truth about probiotic supplements. At this very moment, your body is colonized inside and out by millions upon millions of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, yeast, and more. We used to think that these microbes were harmful, but we now know that these microbial colonies inside us, aka the microbiome, help us survive and thrive. Some of them do make us ill, some of them keep us healthy, and others don't really do anything. Taken all together, they're known as the gut microbiome. You can think of all of this as a garden. There are some flowers and there are some weeds, some patches of soil where plants thrive and others where nothing grows. You plant some seeds, water them, maybe give them some fertilizer and with some sunshine and a bit of luck, they'll take root and grow. Well, you can think of your healthful bacteria as those flowers and the ones that cause you to get ill as the weeds. Both types of bacteria live, evolve and die in your gut all the time. You can aim to plant new flowers in your gut garden, that is to say, add new essential live bacteria by ingesting them in foods like yogurt or supplements which claim to have bacteria in the form of drinks, powders, or gummies. These healthful bacteria are called probiotics. And just like a gardener feeds his prize rose bush with fertilizer, we can help our good bacteria to thrive by eating the kinds of food they like. These foods are known as prebiotics. And just like some gardens harbor skeletons six feet under, well, we'll leave that analogy there. So if it's just a case of adding probiotics and feeding them with prebiotics, surely it makes sense to take all the supplements and cute little drinks that you can see in the supermarket market, the more the merrier, right? Well, it's not that crazy of an idea, but the catch is that we don't really know what a good or bad microbiome looks like. Not to mention the fact that everyone's microbiome is different and constantly changing due to dietary, environmental, and social factors. This means we don't really know how probiotics work, which ones to take, and what dosage, and as we're about to see, even whether they actually do us more harm than good. We said earlier that eating prebiotics is like adding fertilizer to your garden. Of course, you can also add weed killer to get rid of the plants you don't want, and if you're not careful, that herbicide can kill the plants you do want to keep. Antibiotics have a similar effect on the gut microbiome. As wonderful as they are at killing the bacteria that make us ill, they can't actually tell the good guys from the bad guys in many cases, and end up killing a lot of the healthful microbes in the gut as well. When that happens, who gets to colonize the prime real estate in your intestines, the healthful bacteria, or the harmful stuff is simply a matter of who moved the quickest. A group of researchers decided to take advantage of of this fact. After giving their healthy participants a week-long course of antibiotics, they divided them into three groups. One group took a commercially available probiotic containing 10 different strains of bacteria. Remember, the more diverse your bugs, the better. A second group received a fecal microbiota transplant from their own poo. Yep, poo collectors a real job and that brings a whole new meaning to the phrase shoveling shit. The third group didn't receive anything, just to see what would happen naturally. Whose guts would you guess recovered the quickest? Well, the group that received the samples of their own bacteria in the form of a poo transplant recovered their gut microbes in a matter of days. In contrast, the group that didn't receive anything needed three weeks for their gut microbes to return to normal. And the ones who took the probiotics? By the time the study finished, five months after they'd been given the antibiotics, they still hadn't returned to their baseline level of gut health and had lower levels of gut diversity compared to the other two groups. This finding challenges the current dogma that probiotics are harmless even if they don't work. Admittedly, a belief that I once subscribed to. So what is going on here? Why did the probiotics seem to make things worse? Well, in the same way that two animal species will compete with each other in an ecosystem, the different bacteria living in your intestines are in constant state of turf war. Normally, the right mix of healthful, harmful, and harmless bacteria keep us healthy, but it is possible to have too much of a good thing. For one thing, probiotic supplements are designed to colonize the large intestine, but to get there, they have to pass through the stomach and small intestine. However, 
Further, for some individuals who have problems with moving food through their digestive system, the probiotics they consume could remain in the small intestine where they create metabolic byproducts which could lead to bloating and discomfort. Even if they do make it to the large intestine by flooding your microbe with large concentrations, even of healthful bacteria, you take away space for anything else. And that includes different strains of healthful bacteria. In contrast, commercial probiotics usually only contain a limited range of bacterial strains. For example, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, which helps to reduce the risk of antibiotic-related diarrhea, promote dental health, and relieve symptoms of IBS. Or Bifidobacterium animalis subspecies lactis, which has been associated with immune health and healthy levels of cholesterol. But these health benefits are not the only reason these bacteria tend to be the most commonly used in probiotic supplements. They also happen to be among the most studied strains of bacteria and therefore the easiest and cheapest to produce. Now, that doesn't mean they won't be effective for certain people with certain conditions, but it does mean the average commercial probiotic is a generic preparation that may not be what you need, and if you already have a healthy amount of that bacteria in your gut, it may actually cause you more harm than good. Of course, that assumes that any probiotics you consume in a supplement actually remains in your body. A group of researchers at the Wiseman Institute of Science gave their participants a specially prepared probiotic cocktail of 11 strains of bacteria for a month. They then collected samples from those individuals, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine, to see whether the microbes they'd consumed had successfully colonized. For half of these 25 people, it seemed that the healthful microbes had simply gone in one end and straight out the other, while the other half, the bacteria had briefly held on before being evicted by the existing tenants of the gut microbiome. I told you, it was a turf war. Again, this study suggests that a generic preparation cannot be assumed to work the same in all individuals. And remember, in all these studies, the researchers used precise doses of pure strains of probiotics. Unfortunately, as we're going to see later on, there is absolutely no guarantee that the probiotic supplements available in the shops contain anything like that. But that study was done with healthy people. What about when you're not so well? Well, when a group of metabolically unhealthy individuals, meaning they could have had high blood pressure, high fasting blood sugar levels, or other markers, were randomly given either a probiotic or nothing, half the participants given the probiotic saw improvements in their health markers. The other half got worse. Now, this could have been because of their different diets, their genes, the existing state of their gut, the researchers simply couldn't tell. But this emphasizes the fact that the same probiotic affects different people differently. As a result, there's simply no scientific basis for claiming that a single supplement will have the same effect for everyone and everyone who takes it. Unfortunately, it gets worse. The probiotics available to buy in supplements have been engineered to be resistant to antibiotics. That's great if it means they'll hang around for longer in the intestines. However, it's not so rosy if those genes for antibiotic resistance decide to up sticks and settle in other bacteria that are not so good for us. This process of horizontal gene transfer from healthful bacteria to pathogens is thought to be more likely to happen in individuals consuming large amounts of probiotics. Despite everything I've said so far, I'm not saying probiotics are useless. There's actually decent evidence to suggest that they can be effective to treat specific ailments. And it's very possible that scientists could find more promising uses for probiotics in the future. We just have to look carefully at the evidence and not fall victim to the hype. In the meantime, Time, unless a doctor can prescribe a specific microbial strain to treat a specific issue you have, taking a generic probiotic supplement when you're healthy may unnecessarily stress your gut microbiome. And in the same way that indiscriminate use of antibiotics contributes to the scourge of antimicrobial resistance, in the worst case scenario, taking probiotic supplements could actually be doing you harm. So if all of this is true, should anyone take probiotic supplements? As usual, the devil's in the detail. The first thing to be aware of is the kind of supplements you buy in shops are completely different from the probiotics your colorectal surgeon or gastroenterologist can prescribe. Medical grade probiotics are tightly regulated so you know it literally does what it says on the box. For example, they will have the necessary number of colony forming units we expect to have an impact and the right strains of bacteria for the targeted condition. In contrast, probiotics you can buy in health shops and supermarkets have none of the same regulations applied to them. These products are treated as food rather than medicine. So in the same way food can be sold with frankly meaningless labels, commercial probiotics can also be sold in packaging that bears no resemblance to reality as this study showed. Researchers examined 16 different probiotic supplements and found only one of them actually contained the strain of bacteria it said on the box. Other supplements either didn't have the bacteria they said they had or contained other bacteria that weren't listed. However, this microbial Russian roulette can have far worse consequences than just on your wallet. We know that certain probiotics are useful in treating a terrible intestinal illness that tends to affect premature babies. On such infant born at just 29 weeks,
colleagues was given a commercial probiotic that should have contained three common strains of bacteria that you've seen advertised in products in the supermarket. Unfortunately, it was also contaminated by a fungus that may have contributed to her death shortly thereafter. Yes, this is an extreme case, but it's no exaggeration to say if you consume commercially available probiotics, you cannot be sure what you're taking. So what about the medical stuff? Who is it good for? This review of 66 different studies found that medical grade probiotics could be effective in treating symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. Fecal microbiota transplant had the same effect. That's literally some good shit there, man. We also know that people suffering from antibiotic related diarrhea may benefit from Saccharomyces boulardii, for example. But again, if you're suffering from this condition, go to your doctor and take the probiotic they prescribe you, not the one they happen to have available in the supermarket that day. So if you're lucky enough not to suffer from one of these various conditions and a select few others, where should you get your probiotics from? Well, Mother Nature gives us a clue right at the beginning of life. When a child is about to be born, as far as we know, these tiny munchkin's guts are sterile. Literally, no gut microbes. However, during the passage through the birth canal and subsequently through breastfeeding, the baby's gut is quickly colonized by bacteria living in and on its mother. Even for those women for whom breastfeeding is difficult and challenging, the skin-to-skin -skin contact means a mass migration of bacteria from mum to little one. The lesson here is to get your probiotics from nature's very own probiotic supplements. They're called food, but not just any food. Fermented foods like kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, and kimchi all contain probiotics. Even so, not all of these products are created equal. One way you can tell whether kombucha contains live bacteria is by looking at the sediment settling at the bottom of the drink. If you can see that, it's a good sign that the bacteria are alive. What about kefir? Well, take a look at the ingredients list. If a bottle names the bacterial strain that's present in the bottle, that's a good sign that it likely contains live bacteria. Also look at the expiry date. If a bottle tells you to consume the product in X days, while another has an expiry date in X months, this is another indication that the former contains live bacteria while the other probably doesn't. It is true that with many fermented foods, you won't know which strains of bacteria you're eating, nor the quantity in which you're eating them. However, what you can rely on is that in general, you'll get a wide variety of bacteria, therefore a healthier gut from food rather than supermarket supplements. So quite simply, eat fermented foods to get your probiotics, not just because of any health claims made about them, but because they're cheaper than supplements and delicious to eat. They'll also give you lots of other benefits. For example, fermented veg will supply you with vitamins, fiber, and antioxidants, while yogurt provides protein and calcium. Although be mindful with a product like yogurt as if it's been pasteurized after being inoculated with live bacteria, those handy microbes will have been killed and therefore unable to do you any good. Now, if at this point you're starting to despair at how complicated this whole situation sounds, I sympathize. But the good news is, is it doesn't have to be so difficult. In the same way that in the 19th century, it took just one simple action, doctors washing their hands to reduce the number of women who died in childbirth by 90%, there is one simple action you can take to drastically improve your gut health. Here's Dr. James Kinross, world leading microbiome expert and bowel cancer surgeon at Imperial College London. So I'll answer that question, but before I do, please eat more fiber if you don't, if you're listening to this. Just seven <laughs> grams more a day and your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, you know, neurodegeneration, everything falls, right? And it's not hype, it's real science. Science that we've known for like, you know, 50 years. In fact, research has shown just how dramatic an effect eating fiber can have on gut health. African-American men have the highest rates of bowel cancer in the world and eat on average 18 grams of fiber per day, just over half the recommended amount of 30 grams. On the other hand, rural South Africans eat almost three times that amount of fiber and unsurprisingly, zero ultra-processed foods and very little animal products. When these two groups of individuals swap diets, how long do you think it took for their gut health to reverse? Two weeks. Yes, you can make rapid positive change to your gut health just by increasing your fiber intake. So the next time you go shopping, consider swapping your refined grain products and your bread and your rice and your pasta for their whole grain alternatives. Maybe add some raspberries to your cereal in the morning or top your favorite sandwich filling with grated carrot to boost your fiber intake. And if you add in those fermented foods to increase fiber, that's going to be absolute rocket fuel for your gut microbiome. Just remember one thing, get used to reading the label. Look for the amount of fiber included and aim for that 30 grams per day target. Does it contain named probiotics? If so, it's probably worth eating. You'll need to consume these foods regularly for several weeks before they can have a real effect. Make eating them a habit and don't expect overnight results. But it's not all doom and gloom. As we've mentioned already, there are some proven benefits of probiotics for various conditions. And undoubtedly, the more we understand about the complex relationship between the microbial and human parts of our body, the more likely it will be that we can create novel treatments. I am cautiously optimistic we will have some high quality consumer
consumer grade probiotics in the not too distant future, but it needs more rigorous science and research. And bloody hell, I might even get stuck into that research myself to help the cause. So now you know to be wary of unscrupulous influencers touting the benefits of generic probiotic supplements. You've probably also heard them doing the same for continuous glucose monitors. To find out the truth about these digital gizmos, click here to watch the video now.